Welcome. This podcast is an exploration into being human and what's possible when there's less attention on the noise in our heads. Warning. While listening to this broadcast, you may experience moments of deep peace, sighs of relief, personal insights, or long stretches of dead air. Do not be afraid. This is normal. Under the Noise with Wynne Morgan and Kate Roberts. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Under the Noise with me, Wynne Morgan, and my co-host, Kate Roberts. Hi, Wynne. Hi, Kate. And today we are delighted to be joined by Dickin Bettinger. Hi, Dickin. Hi, Wynne. Hi, Kate. Hi. As a quick introduction... I can't remember, Dick, in the first time I met you or saw you speak in person. But here's the other thing that always strikes me about you, that in the times that I've bumped into you, whether it's in a place for breakfast or it's dinner at a friend's house watching basketball, (laughs) which I remember very fondly, (laughs) or anywhere else in... Los Angeles and La Conna and other places in Minneapolis. And there's a quality that I've noticed about you that instantly calms me down Mm. and brings me home. And often it's without any kind of consciousness on my behalf, it just happens. And anyway, I just wanted to to let you know of that Mm. experience that I have in your company. You know, it's striking that the title of your podcast is Under the Noise, and you talk about calming down. Because we all know what it is to be up tight, Mm. right? And, but we don't often see the value or the benefits of calming down. So it's interesting that in my perception, when most adults are feeling tension or stress or upset even, they do more thinking so they get even more up in their head. And there's certainly beautiful benefits of being in our head and thinking about things, but that's also where we end up getting stuck and up tight. And it's nice to learn the benefits that are available to all of us when we touch that calm or quiet place underneath all the noise of our personal thinking. It's really, really nice to experience that benefit. And it was once we started experiencing the benefit of that in our lives that we could share with other people that these benefits are universal. In a, in a calm, clear mind, people have clarity and think better. They feel better. They use their minds in a very different way. Very different way. The, the teacher I had used to say there's it's all the same mind, but there's two, two fundamental ways of using the same mind. One is like a computer where we're actively thinking, using already known ideas and information, memory. But there's another way of using the mind that people are not as familiar with, and it's where all the amazing benefits come from. Clarity, perspective, common sense, insight, inspiration, motivation, aspiration, new and fresh thinking. For example, when I would work in companies, people would often 
call me in to consult when they were stuck on a problem of some sort. And without realizing it, they were stuck because they were stuck in the same old thinking and that the cure for that is new and fresh thinking, inspiration, in inspiration, in ovation, right? Insight. And once people learn to use their mind in this other way, which is being open to a much deeper intelligence than is contained in the computer. Once people became open to that, they began to think more creatively, more wisely, more insightfully, make better decisions, experience less stress. So in our trainings, we would point in this direction of finding a balance between the intellect and wisdom, between the intellect and a deeper presence that allows for new and fresh thinking. We'd point in that direction at some point with the group we were with, or even when we weren't working in companies with people sort of stuck on something in their life. And, but in companies, the funny thing was at first they just hated how slowly we talked and they just couldn't stand it. And it was like, come on, come on, just say it, get, hurry up and get to the point. When are we going to start? <laughs> and we realized they didn't know why we were pointing in this direction. So we had to explain to them that any human being, when they temporarily step back from their computer, they don't become dumb and stupid, but they become more fully present and they have access to new and fresh thinking and they begin to feel better and be more inspired. And as the logic of that sunk in, pretty soon on our feedback forms, evaluations of our work, they, the thing they loved the most was that they learned the benefit and value of going beneath the noise, quieting down and accessing deeper feeling and new and fresh thinking. <laughs> and that's what they liked most about the trainings. <laughs> they had time to reflect and find the answers they hadn't found before. Wow. What was the biggest resistance that you had at that time that you remember? It I have to tell you, at first, we had a lot of resistance because we were in our heads speaking to their intellects. Yeah. <laughs> and in a sense, we're trying to convince them of something. And we got all kinds of resistance. And as we gained deeper insight into the nature of the mind, and we began to walk the talk more. And I tell you, we got less and less and less resistance as our understanding got deeper because, number one, like a lot of the people I was working with were engineers, and engineers love logic. And once they started hearing the logic of how the mind works and our natural capacity to access greater resources within our minds, they love this. They, they couldn't get enough. I would do one training, they'd be begging for another, and then another team would see that team changing, and then I'd get a call from someone I didn't know saying, we want what those guys got. They used to be so 
stressed out and frenetic, and now they're calm and productive, and and they seem to really enjoy, are enjoying themselves at the same time. So uh, it's interesting if you if you speak to someone beyond just their intellect, it resonates on a level deeper than intellect and you don't get resistance. It starts making sense to people because we've all experienced the benefits of being in a state of mind where we feel inspired and creative and responsive and, and, even in traditional problem solving, they say, think about a problem and then set your computer aside and brainstorm because that's the only way you're going to find new and fresh answers to any problem. And yet most of us don't do that. And so we explain what gets in the way of doing that and why looking in that direction has enormous payoffs in life, in relationships, in work, enormous payout, payback. I want everybody to know this, Kate and Wynn. I, I, I want everybody to know that we're connected to a deeper intelligence that brings us feelings that uplift and thinking that inspires and is helpful and useful in a very practical way. I want everybody to learn this. So that's what my career is dedicated to, spreading the word globally. And again, one of the inspirations for the, for the genesis of this podcast was exactly to that end. I, I told you that when I heard the title of your podcast, I was immediately intrigued because we all know what it's like to get caught up in the static in the attic, you know, to get caught up in the gerbil wheel of our own thinking, to get bogged down by thinking so much about a problem that it seems more and more complicated and difficult and stressful. We all know what it's like when we misuse our computer and try and get it to do something it was never intended to do. Mm. We don't go to a computer. We go to the computer because we can Google all kinds of cool information. <laughs> Unbelievable. I mean, I love using the computer that way. It's really fun and, and helpful for working in the field of the known and what's known. Uh, but it, we don't go to a computer to find inspiration itself. That we find inside of us. To find passion for life to find uplifted, to find love and understanding. We don't find that in the computer, right? That's in this other dimension of our mind. You could call it wisdom mind. We've got the intellect and then there's a deeper intelligence. And so, I mean, even at, at, at Harvard, they talk about that IQ is a poor measure of a person's intelligence because it only measures how well they can use their computer. It doesn't measure how well they can access new and fresh thinking, creative thought. It doesn't measure a person's well-being, right? Because there's something more to human beings than just their computer. Otherwise, we're just mechanized robots walking around stuck in whatever we've learned and have no access to deeper feeling and creative thought. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times, for example, 
I went into companies and they said, this is an insolvable problem. We've been working on it for years and it, we just get more polarized in our discussions and it's not going anywhere and people are arguing and fighting and it's not pretty and lots of stress. Uh, and our performance is going down. And I'm thinking, well, as soon as they understand where to find what they're looking for, they're gonna, they'll, they'll be up and running and, and in no time solve this. And sure enough, once people saw the logic that the only thing in the way of cre creative, responsive, agile thinking which is necessary to solve a problem. The only thing in the way of that is when people get bogged down in their computer thinking. It puts a lid on the ability of our mind to respond to any problem creatively. And it's innocent, but I, I tell you, everybody is looking for freedom from thoughts that bog them down. Everybody likes to feel unburdened. Everybody, I've seen no exceptions to this. And, and everybody likes the discovery that when we're unburdened, we think better and we do better, period. I mean, that's true in sports, that's true in relationships, that's true in business. Anybody who is an athlete will tell you, if I get bogged down in my thinking, my performance goes out the window and my enjoyment for this sport diminishes. Anybody in sports will tell you that. They, they have learned the value of using the mind wisely and being wide open to responsive thinking in the moment. Oh, now, the same is true though for people in relationships or people in business. There's two ways of using our mind and we can use the intellect wisely, but we can also use it unwisely because it's a tool. And when we get out of balance and don't have a balance between wisdom and intellect, we suffer psychologically and performance suffers. And so everybody is looking for balance. Everybody is looking for the being unburdened and being creatively responsive to life, no matter what gets thrown our way. And difficulties and challenges do get thrown our way. So a question that struck me that someone could be thinking and listening to what you've just said. If we're looking for a balance between intellect and wisdom, yeah. how do I know the right balance? Well, that's what I love about the mind. It's a complete system. And it's created from this intelligent source. So when we use our intellect wisely, we plan things, we, we use language to communicate, we, we think about what we know, we retrieve information we have stored, all the valuable things we've learned in school, we can retrieve that information and utilize it, we can process information. That's utilizing the intellect wisely. The instant we start using the computer for something that it wasn't built for, love and understanding, uh, passion, uh, creativity, uh, outside the box, creativity, uh, uh, that, that new and fresh thinking, which is essential for anything to move forward or essential for transcending and going beyond problems, right? So 
it requires an understanding of a deeper capacity of the mind. And without that understanding, we get out of balance. So here's the, here's the beautiful thing when that it, when I learned this, it was so powerful. Whatever I'm feeling is created by the thinking I'm doing in the moment, not by my circumstance. Now, the implication of this is profound. It means everything I'm feeling, my stress isn't coming from my circumstance. My, my upset, my uh, stuckness is not a function of circumstance. It's being created in that moment by my thinking so that when I begin to use the computer in a way it wasn't intended for, it starts creating, the thinking we're doing starts creating tension or stress or upset. And those feelings, since they're not coming from the outside, indicate something that's going off internally. Like when you're driving a car, warning lights come on the dashboard. They're not an indication of what's happening in the cars around you. They're an indication that something is not right in your engine. <laughs> Right, so then tensions and stress in life, in relationships and in the workplace becomes a gift. It's a biofeedback within the intelligence of the system to let us know that we're out of balance, that we're overutilizing the intellect and we're not allowing wisdom to weigh in and bring us its perspective and clarity and common sense and new and fresh ideas, creative responsiveness. We're not giving room for that. And the logic is pretty simple. When our minds are relaxed and open as, a as opposed to being closed-minded, we now have room for new and fresh feeling and thinking to arise, to fill us, to come to mind. So it's a built into the system. Thank God we feel stress in our relationships or in life or in, at work because it's like an alarm clock going off, letting us know we're over-utilizing the intellect, not using it wisely. Uh, and it's, as we, as we tell our teenage kids, you've had enough screen time, you, you really have to get off the screen, put it down, come back to the now and be open to being inspired and living in an inspired life, which is what everybody wants anyways, to live a life full of inspiration and enjoyment and love and creativity. And I know that's what I was always looking for. That's why I became a psychologist originally. I not, not only wanted more of that in my life, but I wanted more of that in my family. And I wanted more of that in to be able to share what I learned about that with other people so they could have more of that in their life. There's a metaphor there that I don't know I've heard so clearly before as right now. It goes back to the, the dashboard of the car that mm. tells us there's something up with a car, our car, not the other cars. Exactly. Something within the system of the car. Right. And then when, and I remember it vividly for me, when I would get overheated and my dashboard was revved up and I was in my intellect, it always looked to me as if it was coming from the outside. Yeah. It wasn't my own yeah. system. That was the indicator. It was, that was an indicator that something out there isn't right. That car is misbehaving and that's the cause of my over revving. That's the cause of my engine overheating. 
And what you've just said, I think, is just a wonderful way of realizing that that isn't coming from anything other than from our own system. Mm. And that's a beautiful, and I don't think I hear it that often when someone says, thank God for stress. Yeah. Right? Which is something that you said, because it is a way that we can then go back, get reflective, and then realize that, wait a minute, that's me. Without understanding that my stress is created by my own thinking and not my circumstance, I didn't like stress because it's being done to me by life. So I felt victimized and I hated stress. I hated feeling that way. So I, I try to get rid of it by doing all the thing, all the things that the books say you need to do to get over stress, the seven steps or the 21 steps or the techniques. And, and so I was constantly trying to manage the stress that I felt the world caused me. And I, when I started working in businesses, I started seeing most often it was stress that was creating the problem for the people in the workplace. When people are stressed, they don't work well. They don't think clearly. They don't make good decisions. They don't communicate very clearly and effectively. They don't solve problems while they're caught in stress. Productivity goes down. Mistakes are made. Now, I knew that to be true from the years in which I played sports. When I was caught up in my head and stressed out, I did not perform well and I wasn't a good team player. And when I was out of my head, you could say in your heart or in this open mind, boy, did I enjoy sports just every moment. And, and, I was doing stuff I didn't even know I could do, right? And, and, and did well. But as soon as I stepped off the field or the court, I'd be back in my head. And that thinking would generate anxiety or worry or stress or confusion, a lot of just confusion. And then I'd try to think my way out of those things because I didn't like them. And I try to do my way out of those things. So what a joy to come across the teaching that says actually and scientifically stress does not come and never has come from circumstance. It's created from within via thought. And when your thinking changes, the feeling changes. That's how people get over stress. Their head clears of thoughts that create the stress. So that was a turning point for me in terms of feeling, because then feelings were indicated, were indi an indication that I was caught up in and holding thoughts that were creating this tension. I was holding my attention on and thinking in a way that was feeding and keeping alive this stress. And I'd lose my resilience. I would get down and stay anxious or stressed. But seeing that it was coming from inside, when I would see it was my own thinking, of course, I'd take my hands off the thinking that's creating that discomfort. Just like when you put your hand on a hot stove, when you realize where the pain is coming from, you don't need techniques. You don't need effort. You don't need trying. You just go, oh. So when I've been sharing this with people all over the world, when anyone begins to realize right now at this moment, my tension is created by my own thinking, it brings people back to the now. And in the now, stress can't be chronic. Our thinking is no longer stuck and it flows. We drop that stressful thinking and we become less burdened by it. We start lightening up, right? Feeling better. 
right? When people are upset, when they get that upset thinking off their mind, they feel better. When we feel better, we're wide open to new and fresh thinking. So thank God we feel tension, stress, and upset if we understand that's a beautiful part of the system that it's, it's the alarm letting us know it's time to allow some balance from this deeper intellect, this deeper knowing, this deeper way of using thought, this deeper mind, this tapping into the wisdom of that is behind all of life. So that, that was an insight. When I realized stress was a call to wisdom, it's serving our awakening is an indication we're innocently misusing the computer, trying to get new and fresh thinking out of a computer, trying to get feelings of well-being out of a computer. It, it doesn't, no one can do that. It doesn't work that way. It's an innocent misunderstanding. Dick, and I've heard um, or read that that our feelings are a lot like a compass where kind of love is the true north, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the further we move away from that, like you said, we have these yeah. feelings of stress or anxiety, anger, all of that. So if those emotions of stress are our gifts that we're moving away, yeah, who we are, I guess, the yeah. true north. What do you think when we are in personal thought that actually feels good. It's still personal thought. Yeah. But it has such a different feel and it's almost like guidance in the opposite direction. Hmm. How do you see personal thought, but personal thought that seems to align more with that intelligence and with that, that love that, that we are. Well, let me start with the love that we are. Okay. Let, let, let me start there and work backwards or forward or whatever way from, from, from that. Let, let me just explain to you why in wisdom teaching, or from teachers throughout the centuries, they've, they'll say love is our true nature. Why have they said that and what's the evidence? And well, let me just start with observation, whether it's a, my own experience or watching other people. When we're caught up in thought, that's when we feel different and separate from life, from people. For example, if we went for a walk in the woods, Kate, and I was caught up in my personal thinking, I can pretty much guarantee you I wouldn't see any beauty around me. Mm -hmm. I may not even notice the trees. I've done that before where I'm worrying about a problem and I don't experience any enjoyment or beauty or feelings of connection. When I walk in the woods, if we walk in the woods and our minds get quiet, I guarantee we'll see beauty. I guarantee we'll start feeling a connection to the trees, a connection to each other, 
I've many times gone for a walk in the woods with friends. And when we get quiet, we're just living. Our senses are so awake and alive when our minds are open. And we fall in love with nature and we fall in love with each other in a really beautiful sense. Now, I've shared this understanding with men and women in prison. And they're walking around caught up in thoughts, feeling different and victimized and abused. And when they begin to learn their feelings are held in place by their own thinking, they begin to have more and more moments where they're free of those thoughts. And they say, I've found my freedom in prison. I feel freer than I did on the outside. And always they start feeling more connected to people. So the truth of the matter is we're all connected to life on a deeper level because we're all part of this infinite field of energy. All the physicists are saying this these days. This is the heart of quantum understanding right? We're all part of this infinite field of energy, whether in form or formless, it's all the same field. And so there is already this underlying unity in life. And our thinking creates a sense that we're separate and different. So it would be like if we're a wave on the ocean, and we're always thinking, we'd always think I'm a little wave, and I'm different than all the other waves, and we're not connected. And when you fall out of that misunderstanding, you go under the noise of your thinking into an experience of connection. You realize the oceanness of life. So that's why people who have gotten really quiet, whether they're meditators or creative people or inventors or scientists, who ha Einstein talks all about this, uh, uh, of dropping into this space where new and fresh come. And always people start feeling more connected to whatever is around them. Whatever is around them. Th so the feeling of love is a recognition of the truth of unity and connection that's already in existence. Now, we're given this gift of having a compu computer. It was part of an evolutionary process where our brains developed to the point that they could also be used to store information, process information. It creates a sense of time. We can say, I'll see it tomorrow for lunch, and we can understand what that means. When we fall out of thinking, we fall out of concepts of time. We experience the timeless now, and always there's quiet, always quiet in this space within, quiet, and a feeling of connection, mm -hmm. peace, joy, love. So... There's nothing wrong with using our computer. It's a gift and it, it's a beautiful thing. It allows us to create speech and language and math and share ideas and process information and figure out what time to go to the airport. And there are times when we either overuse it, even positive thinking, like you're asking about, if we stay in positive thinking, we still are not accessing new and fresh. Mm -hmm. So when people go beyond positive and negative thinking, they define, they discover new and fresh thinking that by nature is uplifting and useful and wise and loving. Mm -hmm. So when we get out of balance, we start having difficulty in life, at work, in our, in, in our relationships. Mm -hmm. 
for years, I tried to be a positive thinker. <laughs> and it took so much effort and so much work. And when I was thinking positive, I was not fully present. So my, my kids called me space cadet. And I'm going, what? I'm, I'm here. I'm positive. But I wasn't here. <laughs> My wife would say, you're not listening. And I say, yes, I am. And I'm thinking about 10 things, right? Because I was, I didn't know about balance. I didn't know about wisdom mind. I didn't know about our core of love, presence, wakefulness. I, I didn't know that. And fortunately, I met a teacher that reminded me of that and it made sense and I just started catching myself thinking up stress constantly and coming back to the present moment over and over again. And then I would feel less burdened and feel a little lighter. And my kids noticed it and they noticed I was being more present and less of a space cadet. And I started lightening up and enjoying life more again and uh, being able to laugh and play. And, and, and then I found out when I was in those states of mind at work, I did extremely well. <laughs> so, that's, a, I, that's a good question though, Kate, about we can even misuse or overuse trying to think positive and be trying to be positive. When we're present, we're not trying. And all that thinking positive and negative settles out. Settles out. We go beneath the noise of all of that. The babbling. My teacher used to say, if you can take one little step beyond your babbling thought system, you'll find a silence and a feeling. And that's where you find what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That was a long way around to get to answering your question. No, I love that. Okay. Silence and the feeling. Yeah. Here's a couple of quotes from my teacher about that. Sometimes he would call silence the state of no thought. You didn't mean you didn't have thoughts, but you weren't engaged in personal thinking. You'd say the state of no thought and the feeling of love are coupled together like lovers. You find one, you'll find the other. You say truth is always found in silence and a, and a beautiful feeling. I want everybody not only to think about this or learn it intellectually, but to experience that when we do rest in the now, there's, there is a beautiful kind of quiet presence. And we start always then when we touch that space, we start feeling, literally feeling more connected to what's in front of us. When I'm with my wife, if I'm thinking all the time, I don't listen well and I don't experience love for her. And when I fall into this space, it's that's why they use the metaphor falling in love. Right? We fall temporarily out of the intellect. We close our laptop. We become fully present, wide open to possibility, wide open to these feelings of connection. And then I fall in love with my wife over and over again. Mm -hmm. We've been married 52 years. And I love that we both 
have an understanding about how the mind works that allow us to fall into a love that is the unity that exists between the two of us. And to celebrate that. It's an unconditional love or an undying love. It's, it's a love that's always there under the noise for anybody, for any human being, no exceptions. Dickin, I'd love a listener listening right now to be able to find that quote from Sidney Banks. Which, which quote? So you did mention just now about the, you know, your teacher and you yeah. had a quote about the lovers. Oh, yeah. I can tell you where that's from if you're interested. Yeah, I'd love to. <clears throat> uh, here it is. It's from a book that talked about the early teachings of Sid Banks, who was my teacher, it's called The Island of Knowledge. Island of Knowledge, it's in there. Yeah, it's a little paperback. You can it it talks about how this welder from Scotland with a ninth grade education had this awakening or enlightenment experience, and and you get a good sense about how he talked about what he realized uh, early on if people are interested, or you can go to www.sidbanks, S-Y-D-Banks.com. And there's free videos and audios that anyone can live stream and listen to. He is quite a teacher, quite a, the most ordinary down to earth man who went from being an insecure welder to a world teacher and could talk to a room full of engineers and tell them why Einstein's e equals MC squared couldn't have been true. And he can, and, 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 and settle, settle down a whole room of, of physicians and get them uh, fully engaged in learning about well-being and, and wisdom. So, yeah, interesting interesting person and we'll add that link if you didn't catch it we'll add that link to the description and the uh, linda queering wrote that linda um, queering's the island yeah. of knowledge it's sort of an introduction to the early teachings of yeah. sydney banks and Beautiful. the website would have more of his later teaching about these three universal principles of thought consciousness mind it's good stuff again I could listen to you for weeks <laughs> it's been delightful being with both of you honestly oh, likewise. really delightful and so glad we can have this talk and share this message with a greater audience thank so, you so thanks to the audience thank you yeah. Bye -bye. You've been listening to Under the Noise. I'm Kate Roberts. I'm here with my co-host, Wynne Morgan, and also Dickin Bettinger. Thanks, Dickin, again for being with us. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to email us. If you have any ideas of things that you'd love for us to chat about, please email Wen or Kate. Um, all that information is at the end of the podcast or down below if you're watching on YouTube. And thank you for joining us. Thanks for joining us. We'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and review. If you have a topic or question that you'd like us to chat about, email Wynn or Kate at win at winning.co.uk and kate at katerobertscoaching.com. Until then, enjoy what's possible under the noise.